Hello? Hey. Hello. Okay. Technology is wonderful, but it often has hiccups. Yeah. So I was going to make sure everyone is able to come in. Let's see. Okay. All right, while we're waiting, just to make sure everybody is here, does anybody have any questions from the previous material? Uh, no. No. Okay. All right. I'm going to then try to share the screen. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yeah. Hello? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so what I want to do today is talk about material that is not going to be directly related to the project that we're going to eventually get to. So the project that I want you all to work on together is related to error detection and error correction. Uh, okay. Just one second. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to talk a bit more about how you find a research problem, how you attack it, how you can gather data to try to get a sense of what might be true. So these are all going to be tremendously useful skills. I also want you to get a sense of how to conjecture. How can you figure out theoretically what the answer might be? So have any of you heard of the German tank problem? Uh, no. Uh, no. No. Okay. This is one of my favorite problems in probability. And so I've been about this problem for a long time. I became very interested in it a few years ago. And it turns out that there are some very natural generalizations which no one has looked at. And I, I was absolutely shocked to find out that nobody had looked at these generalizations. And so what had started as just a, you know, my lectures has actually turned into a problem I've now done research on and I'm extending further with colleagues. Right, let's see. Right. So, I'm going to start off by talking about World War II in the European theater. So, if you click on the video, you can see, I believe, a day-by-day -day map of how the German armies are advancing in World War II. I don't know how familiar you are with the theater. But there was a lot of stuff leading up to, in the end, in uh, September 1939, the Germans invading Poland. And then you had a couple of months of like a phony war where Germany was at war with France and Britain, but there really wasn't much action going on. And then all of a sudden, come spring, the German armies, the German armies start to advance. And the Germans had a masterful use of tanks and warfare. And their troops were able to advance extremely rapidly. So you see the difference in Europe from you know, 1941 to 1942. You know, France has fallen. Most of Southeast Europe has fallen. Uh, most of European Russia has fallen. You know, the Russians stopped the Germans uh, at very important key battles. But you can just see how much they've advanced. It was an incredible challenging time for the Allies. And they need to know precisely what were the German forces and where were the German forces. Now, cryptography plays a lot of roles in this. So in World War II, the Allies actually cracked the German codes and also cracked the Japanese codes. So this meant that there were times when German generals would radio Berlin and say, we have a 
the last order was gobbled, could you transmit our orders again? The Allies had already decrypted the message, and they could have told them, hey, Berlin wants you to attack in the following spot. Obviously, of course, you can't give away to the other side that you've cracked their codes. So now, how do you figure out how many tanks are producing? If you know how many tanks they're producing, or if you know how many tanks they have in the grid, you have a huge tactical advantage, an idea of the strength of the enemy you're fighting. So can anybody think of ways that you might figure out how many tanks the Germans are producing a month? Tanks are in the theater of battle. So you could call up Berlin and you could ask, please tell us how many tanks you're producing and could you tell us how many tanks you've deployed? How likely is it that you will get an answer? Uh, so you like choose a one week interval and, and record the number of tanks that it employed like every week. Make a graph. The number of tanks that what? So like um, you record the number of uh, tanks they employ every week and then make a I, graph. I can't understand what you're saying. The number of tanks that you what? And that they employ every week. That they employ? Yeah. What does it mean to employ? Uh, sorry, that they, uh, they use every week. And so how, how would you know how many tanks the Germans use in a week? Just... You might, you might be right. You just have to be very explicit. Uh, how do I know how many tanks the Germans use in a week? Maybe we can do some sampling. Okay, so be explicit. So tell me what you mean by sampling. Wait, can you very can you just... good, clear, sharp answers? Where you just say how many tanks they employ by sampling? Please tell me what you're doing. Wait, can't you just sum up the the number of tanks that you observe at different battlefields? Okay, do you think you've observed every tank? Yeah. So for instance, you know, the, German could the Germans could have 5,000 tanks in an army. You could see the same tank in many different battlefields in the same week. How do you know it's a different tank every time you see it? It's, it's, it's not a bad idea to try to use some kind of sampling to estimate. But you know, the difficulty is you have to make sure you don't count the same tank multiple times. So something along those lines will work, but you have to be a little bit more careful. So one way is to try to use spies and espionage. You know, to try to get people inside the German plant to try to look at their production records. Another is to look at sampling, as you suggested. But there's this technical issue of double counting. Here's a way to make sure you don't double count a tank. Only count destroyed tanks. And so the Germans had serial numbers on their tanks for a lot of reasons it's convenient to have serial numbers consecutive integers. Can you think of why that might be useful? Because a tank cannot be destroyed twice, so it cannot double count. 
Well, th th that's the advantage of why you want to count the destroyed tanks. But why might you want to have the serial numbers of the tanks consecutive integers? So they can know themselves, they can better know themselves how, uh, how many they produced. So could you do that if the serial numbers were some random number? No, it's like... It would be hard, it would be hard to just quickly look at the random number and tell how many tanks you've made. Also, the serial number could encode things such as maybe what month the tank was built. And then you might say, oh, this tank now probably needs maintenance. So there's a lot of convenience for having consecutive numbers. It makes looking at some of the tank records much easier. But the Allies, unbeknownst to the Germans, were able to use the captured serial numbers to estimate how many tanks were produced and how many tanks were in theater. Nowadays, a lot of websites and companies, they encode information like this so people can't tell how many things there are. So if you think about it, there's situations like this all the time where they don't want you to know how many people there are. So if you're a company, you want to seem popular. So when you're selling people products, you know, this is not the first product you've sold. You'll have a long serial number, so you can't quite tell how many products you've sold. There's lots of things like this where you try to hide information. So the question is, who do you think did a better job, the spies or the mathematicians, statisticians? Which do you think was more accurate, the spies going into Germany trying to find the information or the people using math and stats? Uh, I mean, I think, I think it depends on the... No, it doesn't depend. I'm giving this lecture. Given that I'm a mathematician and I'm giving this lecture, who do you think did better? The mathematicians. mathematicians. The mathematicians. I wouldn't be talking about this otherwise. This is one of the crowning achievements of mathematics. We beat the spies. We did much better. We'll see how much better later. All right, so here's the general formulation. After battle, we observe the serial numbers on some captured and destroyed tanks, say S1, S2, all the way up to SK, so K tanks. And the question is, how many tanks were produced? So in the original formulation, we assumed that the tanks were numbered from 1 to N. We observe K. The largest seen tank is M, the largest serial number is M, and we want to estimate N with some function of M and K. The new version we which I introduced a few years ago, assumes that we don't know what the lowest value is. And then we just do the problem. And now we do this in terms of the spread, the difference between the smallest and the largest. Okay? So this is the general framework. So there's dangers of both underestimating and overestimating how many tanks are produced or how many tanks are in theater. Can anybody give me a reason it might be bad to either overestimate or underestimate how many tanks there are? If like, you destroy too many tanks at a time, it will be overestimating the tanks they have. Wait, say that again? If like, uh, if someone did, uh, like if the allies destroy too many german tanks at a time like accidentally then it will overestimate the tanks the german have Ho hopefully not hopefully our formula will be good enough so that if we capture a lot of things we'll just observe more serial numbers and we'll have a better estimate but that's a slightly that, that, that's a potential danger is that maybe if we wipe out an entire <coughs> battalion of tanks, we might have too much data, we might make a mistake. 
But I'm thinking more militarily. What could be the danger of overestimating or underestimating? No, like you can, you can like distribute, like you can deploy uh, more troops than necessary at certain areas. Good. So if you overestimate the German strength, you put too many troops in one theater. What's bad about that is you win. <coughs> so you're on the right track. What would be bad about that? Um, and then you probably lose, you probably can't destroy that many of German tanks. No, I mean, if we overestimate how many German tanks there are, we put in more troops than we need for the battle. But it can't hurt us to have too place, many troops in the battle. If you win at one place, then you will lose uh, at all other places. But what that means is if we put too many troops yes. in one place, then we have the possibility of winning in another place or having more troops in another place and that's gone now. So that's a danger of overestimating. What's the danger of underestimating? Uh, so like you, you lose right on the spot. Yeah, you lose on the spot. Now there's another danger from overestimating. So in the US Civil War, President Lincoln once remarked, there's many different versions of this, if General McClellan isn't going to use his army, I'd like to borrow it for a time. And so during the Civil War, General McClellan was always convinced that he was facing an army significantly larger than it actually was. He always overestimated the force he was facing. And so he would always tell, I, I can't attack, I need more troops, I need more troops. And when he would get more troops, he would say, I, I don't have enough troops, I need more troops. And so if you overestimate, there's a danger of paralysis, of being afraid and unable to act. And so uh, from Wikipedia, fountain of all knowledge, source of all wisdom, outnumbered two to one uh, during the Battle of Antietam, Lee committed his entire force while McClellan sent in less than three quarters of his army, enabling uh, Lee and the South to fight the Northern Army to a standstill. So he just constantly felt he was outnumbered and he was overly cautious rather than taking advantage of the opportunities. So for this talk, I want to talk a little bit about some mathematical preliminaries. So, you know, binomial coefficients, which are things we might see later. We'll talk about the original formulation starting at one. I probably won't go through the details of the calculation starting at an unknown point because it's pretty similar. The algebra is just more involved. And so if the only difference is the algebra is more involved, it's really not that enlightening to spend much time on that. I want to talk more about thinking. And so part of this is to introduce you to some good math concepts, but also some good stats concepts. So how many of you have seen linear regression? I do. Yes. One. How many else? Oh, uh, yeah. I've seen it. Okay, good. I did. Two. I, uh, I couldn't hear a little, a little bit. A little bit? So regression is one of the most powerful ideas we have. And I want to show you a little bit about how to use it as well as some of the dangers. So let's talk about mathematical preliminaries. So I think we've done some of this stuff before, so this should be pretty fast. We've all seen n factorial. If you haven't seen any of this, please let me know. It's the number of ways to arrange n objects when automated. n k is the number of ways to choose k items for n when order doesn't matter. And the binomial theme is x to the y to the n is the sum of n choose k, x to the k, y to the n minus k. So have we all seen all this stuff? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, so Pascal's triangle, which I think you've all seen. Uh, the coefficients in the n row come from expanding x plus y to the n, and they have this beautiful relationship n plus 1 choose k is n choose k plus n choose k minus 1. And there's lots of ways to see this. If you haven't seen this, or even if you have, it's a great exercise to just try to write the proof. There's many different ways you can prove it. Um, I'm going to skip the proof, but there's a slide here which gives a hint on how to do it. 
There's a lot of other relationships with Pascal's triangle. So we've focused so far on each row is the sum of elements to the left and right immediately above it. Does anybody know how this is related to Pascal's triangle? Um, this shows whether whether an entry is whether uh, it's either odd or even. Outstanding, outstanding. Now, if you look at Pascal's triangle, it's normally written uh, expanding along the horizontal and bigger and bigger. What I've done is I wrote some computer code, and it was just easier for me to tip it so that you know the first point is on. Zero, zero, and then just move things out. And so my computer program, I just keep adding more and more rows. Well, when you add more and more rows, the problem is the picture would keep getting larger and larger and larger. So I constantly resize the picture to always be inside you know, the same box. And so here's three little snapshots. And every time I have an even point, I remove it. Every time I have an odd point, I put a dot. So since we have ones on the two outsides, we're always going to have dots on the outside. And there's a beautiful fractal pattern that exists here. And so I wrote a little video. I hope this will be viewable. Okay, and so you can see as it adds more and more rows, the fractal structure coming in. So, you know, to me, it's amazing to see how one area of mathematics can appear in another. And of course, this is just looking at even and odds. You could look at more than just even and odds and see other patterns here. Okay. Okay. So now here's another identity we need. The sum of m choose k is n plus 1 choose k plus 1. And just to give you an idea of where we're going to use this, m is going to be the largest observed tank serial number. k is the number of tanks we observe. When you do math, you always want to know why does something work? What allows you to succeed? The miracle for us is this identity, is it allows us to convert some sums to a beautiful closed form expression. It's rare to have something like that. Now, what does it mean to sum m choose k? Well, we fixed k and we vary m. So imagine k equals one. Then we're summing the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, we're going along a diagonal. If k equals two, we're summing the numbers one, three, six, 10, 15. And what this says is if we sum along a diagonal, it's equal to one element later, down and to the right. So if you check one plus three plus six plus 10 is 20, and 20 is the number down and to the right of 10. If we do one plus two plus three plus four, that's 10, that's the number one down and to the right of 10. That's not a proof, but it's at least a nice visual check. And so, is there anybody here who has not seen proofs by induction? No. Okay, everybody has seen proofs by induction, excellent. So we're gonna prove this by proving by induction. So we'll induct on N and we remember that K is fixed. What's the smallest value N could be? Uh, k, k. Yeah, I, if, if n is less than k, it turns out it's still true. What do you think 3 choose 4 is? So zero. Yeah, so it turns out 3 choose 4 is 0. Now, what would 3 choose 4 be? That would be 3 factorial over 4 factorial negative 1 factorial. So what do you think negative one factorial is? So 
So you've told me three choose four is zero. Three choose four should be three factorial over four factorial negative one factorial. So what should negative one factorial be? Like, does it, does it increase without bound? Well, you should be giving me a value for negative one factorial. It can't be, it will increase without bound. It's gotta be something. What should we assign to negative one factorial? So what's three choose four? What did you tell me three choose four equals? Three equals zero. Uh, zero. So we would have three factorial over four factorial negative one factorial. What's the only thing negative one factorial could be? Four place. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Um. Like, if one is that negative one, that there it has four place to put it in. So it's the same like one and four. I, I don't know. Well, let, let's think. Do do you agree that three choose four should be zero? Yes. No. Okay. So if we just go back to the formula for the binomial coefficient, it would be three factorial divided by four factorial times negative one factorial. What's the V factorial? Six. Six. What's four factorial? Uh, 24. Four. Oh, 24. So you've got six divided by 24 times negative one factorial equals zero. What's the only thing negative one factorial could be? Zero. 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 Try again. Wait, but, but, but is it negative one itself? We have uh, to figure out how to interpret negative one factorial. Uh, you want three factorial over four factorial negative one factorial to equal zero, right? Well, it yes. may be the, the infinite large. Well, it has to be infinity. There's no other interpretation. Hmm. Yeah. Right? If you want this to be zero, three factorial and four factorial are nice numbers. The only way this is going to be zero is if negative one factorial is infinity. Similarly, negative two factorial would be infinity. Negative three factorial would be infinity. And this is a generalization of the factorial function. Turns out you can define the factorial function at any place you want. My favorite is negative one half factorial is the square root of pi. And this plays a role in the standard normal, in the Gaussian, in the bell curve. It's where the normalization constant comes from. But it's the most natural way to define things because if you use that definition, then M choose K will still make sense if N is less than K. But for our purposes, we might as well assume M, uh, our, our value of N starts off at least K. When N equals K, this is straightforward. You only have one term on the left. You have K choose K, which is one. And then K plus one choose K plus one is also one. So the, the inductive step is all that remains. The base case is trivial. And now we just have to see the inductive step. So we sum from k to n plus 1. Well, we know what the sum is from m equals k to n. So we just put that in and add the last term, the n plus 1 choose um, k plus 1. So uh, oops, I think this should be, a, I think there's a typo there. Uh, it should be n plus 1 choose k, not n plus 1 choose n plus 1. Sorry about that. So in the first line, it should be m choose k going from k to n plus n plus one choose k. And then we'll get n plus one choose k plus one plus n plus one choose k. And then by Pascal's triangle, by that identity, that's just n plus two choose k plus one. And that completes the proof. All right. 
So now we're ready to move to the German tank problem, the original formulation. Again, one of the main reasons I want to do this is to really get you to start thinking about how would you conjecture mathematics? How would you sniff out a formula? So we want to come up with some estimate for the number of tanks the Germans have produced or have in the field. So we'll call that n hat. It's going to depend on the maximum number that we observe and k, the number of tanks we observe. So I want you to tell me, how do you think n hat is going to depend on m and k? N has to be bigger than M. I'm sorry? N has to be bigger than a maximum. Good. And well, not, 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 not quite. Try again. You're no, close. equal or maximum. You, equal or right. big, bigger than. Right. So we know N has to be at least M. Do you think the larger M is, the larger N is? Yes. What if you fix M and increase K? So if your largest observed tank is 100 and you observe two tanks, or if your largest observed tank is 100 and you observe 10 tanks, would you have the same estimate for N in both cases? So N hat is closer to M. The more tanks so, you observe, the closer I think it should be to. How do you think your estimate depends on K? So if you keep M fixed, what do you think happens as you observe more tanks? Um, if, if M is fixed and uh, K is increasing, the N head will be closer to M. Okay, but you haven't told me how. Okay, could you say that again? I couldn't quite hear you. Okay, um, if... No, 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 no. somebody space. else was talking just a moment ago. Okay. Um, I think it's decreased, but... It's, it's decreasing. Like... Yes. Yeah, right. If you observe the maximum tank serial number is 100, and you observe two tanks versus you observe a thousand tanks. If you only observe two tanks and you see it, the largest is a hundred, I wouldn't be surprised if there was significantly more than a hundred tanks produced. But if I've observed, well, okay, I can't observe a thousand tanks. But if I observe say 95 tanks and the largest of a hundred, I'm pretty confident that the number of tanks is not much more than a hundred. So we could write the expected number of tanks is M, because as you said, we have to start off with N is at least as large as M, plus then some function of M over K. And I claim that a really good choice is there should be maybe some constant B, such as B times M divided by K. So as K increases, our estimate is going to decrease. And as M increases, our estimate will increase. This is the simplest formula that's compatible with our intuition. And it turns out that the answer is very close to this. It's M times one plus one over K minus one. So whenever you see an equation in mathematics, you should always ask yourself, is this reasonable? So how could you check to see if this is reasonable? So uh, you can, uh, um, if you set k equal one. Okay, so why would you want to take k equals one? Um, because it's like the lowest, I guess. Or... Okay, so if you take k equals one, you would basically get two m minus one. So it'd be basically saying that if you take k equals one, you double 
the largest observed serial number, you double the observed serial number. Well, another way of saying that is, if you only have one observation, your observation be much will be the midpoint. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. That's not bad. Yeah. Is there another value of k that would be good to check? Uh, I call k is m. Well, m is the largest observed, so you can't really talk about k being m. Okay. So it's not a bad try. But we don't know what the largest observed is until we actually go into the field. So what else could we try k to equal? A number bigger than one to compare? Infinite. But there's a really natural choice, a really good choice for k. If you choose this for your value of K, I know you can figure out everything. Always think of extreme cases. Oh, and, and hat itself? Well, not, oh, and, yeah. and hat is our estimate, oh, just very close. Just N. We should take K to be? N. Or the actual N. Oh, just N. Not N hat, N hat is an estimate. Yeah, so K equal to N. So set k equal to n. So if k equals n, what would m be? Uh, n. Right. If if k equals n, you've observed yeah. every single tank. So that case, m would equal n, and when you plug it into the formula, you get n hat equals n, which is perfect. So the sanity checks at k equals one, k equals n, suggest that this is a reasonable formula. Again, this is what I want you to get into the habit of. Whenever you see something asking, is this reasonable? What are some extreme cases where the problem might be easier to understand? All right, so now we need a combinatorial lemma. So we're gonna let M be the random variable for the maximum number observed, for the largest serial number. And we're gonna let M, little m, be the value that we see. So we want to calculate what is the probability that we observe different values of little m. What's the probability we observe little m equals one, two, three, four? And I claim first that there is zero probability of observing a value smaller than k. So why is that true? So I claim the probability is zero if M is less than K. Why is that true? Uh, because the, the, so the, the, the there is Yes. Uh, be, be because the, the serial number is uh, monotonically increasing. Uh, what do you mean the serial number is monotonically increasing? Like it, it always increases by one. So if you observed K tanks, it must be. Uh, well, well, must what do you mean by the serial number always increases by one? So like if you, if you put the tanks in a series is going to be one, two, three, four. It's, uh, it's increasing. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't decrease or, or stay the same, I guess. Are you saying as I observe more tanks, the serial number can't get smaller? Uh, yeah. Is that and what you're saying? It. Yeah. And it increases okay, by, we're, uh, we're fixing a K now. So we fixed a K. 
So maybe k equals 10. Why can't the maximum tank be less than 10? So if you observe 10 tanks, is it possible that the largest serial number is five? No. 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 What's the smallest, Bless you. the largest serial number? K. I'm sorry? 10. K. K. If you observe K tanks, the small M could be is K. You know, if, if you observe one, two, three, four, all the way up to K. So we know that the probability of observing an M less than K is zero. What about observing an M greater than N? Is that zero? Yes, we don't have any tanks larger than N. So we only yeah. have to find probabilities between K and N. And I claim it's either M choose K minus M minus one choose K over N choose K, or M minus one choose K minus one divided by N choose K. So we're gonna prove this by story. We're gonna tell a story, we'll give two different proofs. So for the first one, both expressions are dividing by N choose K. That's the number of ways to choose K tanks from N. So what we wanna do is we wanna find out how many subsets of K tanks have their largest one being M? So in the first one, M choose K is how many ways can we choose K numbers between one and M? But if we just choose K numbers between one and M, we might not have M as the largest number chosen, right? Yeah. Yes. So I want to go away all of the things that don't have M as their largest. Well, if I don't have M as their largest, it means I've chosen my numbers from one to M minus one. And that's where the M choose K minus M minus one choose K comes from. I look at all the things whose largest is at most M. I then subtract all the ones whose largest is at most M minus one. And the difference will be how many things are exactly M as their largest. Another way to look at it, and this is the one on the right hand side, is assume our largest one is M. I now have to choose K minus one tanks from one to M minus one. How many ways can I choose K minus one from one to M minus one? It's just M minus one choose K minus one. So that's two different ways of proving it. And the text there is just explaining that. Okay. So the next concept is the concept of the expected value or the mean or the average value. And so the expected value or the average value is I take the probability that uh, big M equals little m and I multiply by m. So you've all seen this. If you have you know, any class where something's worth 20% and something's worth 50% and something's worth uh, 30%, then to find your average, it's, 20 it's 0.2 times the first grade plus 0.5 times the second plus 0.3 times the third. So you just take each value and you multiply it by its probability. So I want to find the expected value of M, the expected largest serial number, given that there are N tanks and given that we observe K of them. Well, because of the previous slide, we have a nice formula for the probability that M equals M. So we plug this in. So what are your thoughts as to how you might try to simplify this? What might you do? Any thoughts on how you might attack this? Okay. Oh. You can simplify it by like putting it in its factorial terms. Put M into that so one. So one idea is to explain out the factorials. Yeah. Uh, did somebody have another? You can put M into the the the, the, the upper one and it will become M over K minus one and uh, is, 
Yes, is correct. maybe move the m into the m minus one. Yes. Just yes. k minus one. Yes. So it will be much. So we have n. two ways. Now notice that. The, so notice the n choose k doesn't change. You with summing over m. So maybe we want to migrate the m inside. So let's see. So as suggested, you know, I expand out the factorials. And if you look at what's going on, the m times the m minus one factorial, as was suggested, becomes an m factorial. And then I multiplied by k and then divided by k going from line two to line three. And that way that k minus one factorial became a k factorial. And now we've got an m factorial over k factorial, m minus k factorial. So one of the most useful things in mathematics is multiplying by one. Another useful thing is adding zero. And by doing stuff like this, you have the opportunity to rearrange the algebra to make it more illuminating. And now we see that we have an m choose k, and then it turns out there was actually no need to expand out the k factorial over n minus k factorial, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, n choose k. And we're left with over here, you know, some nice stuff that doesn't depend on m, and over here, the sum m equals k to n of m choose k. And this is where we now use the combinatorial miracle. There is a closed form expression for that. If there wasn't, we'd be dead. And it would be hard to have a nice exact answer. But because we have a answer for this, we now have it's just k, it's just n plus one choose k plus one. The m is gone, it was the index of summation that's gone. And now we need to do some algebraic simplifications. So we expand out that binomial coefficient. And we see there's a lot of cancellation. And we're left with k times n plus 1 divided by k plus 1. Curiosity, are you able to see all of the text for k plus 1? It's cut off on the bottom of my screen. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm just curious if you see it all, if it's cut off on your You see it all? Uh, yeah. yeah. Is everybody able to see it? Okay. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. So it's just how it's projected. That's good. Okay. So now we have the expected value of m is just k times n plus 1 divided by k plus 1. Well, if we know that the expected value of m is this, we can rearrange and we can solve for n in terms of everything else. And we get n is the expected value of m, 1 plus over k minus 1. And so now, to make this into an estimate, we just substitute for the expected value of m, which we don't know, what our best guess is. And our best guess is just the value we observe. And so when we put that in, we get n hat is m 1 plus 1 over k minus 1. And there you go. So we conjectured what the formula should be. And things worked out very nicely. All right. So if we want to do the more advanced German tank problem, we don't know the minimum value. It's a little bit harder. And again, a lot of people do stuff like this to hide their stuff. You don't want to give away your strength. You don't want to give away how many people are doing things. So we're going to let the lowest tank be N1, the largest tank be N2. So the number of tanks is N2 minus N1 plus 1. And we're going to let S be the spread. It's going to be the distance between the smallest and largest value. And again, we're going to observe K tanks. If we observe K tanks, what's the smallest spread we could have? Uh, K minus one. K minus one, excellent. So what, do you think, what, so what would be your estimate for n? It has to be at least how large? Mm. K plus one. 
Not k plus one. Well, I want an estimate for, well, what, what happens if k equals n? You've observed every tank. So it can't be k plus one. You know, we know it has to be at least as large as k, but can you give me an estimate for n in terms of s? Uh, did you mean the n hat or n? Call it n hat, you know, our, our estimate for n. Okay. So what, what must be true, if we observe a spread of 15, what do you know about n hat? Uh, n hat must be uh, larger, larger than or equal to 16. Right, and same thing for n. If we observe a spread of 15, there has to be at least 16 tanks. As the spread increases, what do you think happens to our estimate for n? It increases. It increases. And then if we keep the spread fixed, but observe more and more tanks, what do you think happens to our estimate? It decreases. It should decrease. So again, we should have some formula as before. It's going to be the spread plus something. And I'm saying that it should be B times S divided by K minus one. Last time we divided by K. Why do you think I'm dividing by K minus one? And is it because it's the, uh, it's the spread plus one? I mean, the, uh, the number of tanks that you, you observe, the, the, the max? That's not a bad thing to try, but then shouldn't I just be adding one? It should be like S plus one plus G of SK. I'm saying, oh, that should be a G of SK, not a G of MK. I'm saying, it's, it's instead of you know, BS over K, it's BS over K minus one. Why would I divide by K minus one instead of K? You know, if K is large, it doesn't make much of a difference, but for small K, it will. So how many of you have taken basic statistics? Mm. Uh, a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. No. Okay, so we've got one no. So you're gonna learn some statistics now. If you only have one observation, can you estimate a sample mean? Can you can you estimate a population mean? No. You have just one. No. You have one. If you want to make an inference, you have to have a lot, big enough sample size. If you want to make a good inference, what if you want to just make an inference? If you only have one observation, can you make a guess for the population mean? Uh, I, guess, I guess yes. Yeah, yeah, equals yeah, the sample. Yeah, it equals your value. If you if you observe a value of ninety five, what's your best guess for the population mean? Ninety five. Ninety five. What would be your guess for the population variance or the population standard deviation? Uh, variance will be very small because there's no spread. I want you to estimate the population variance, the population standard deviation, how much things are spread out. And you only have one observation. Can you estimate how spread out things are from one observation? No. No. Yeah. You only have one observation, there's no change. So if you look in a lot of stats books, and if you look at the concept of the sample standard deviation, you divide not by the number of points, but by one less. 
And the reason is if you only have one observation, you should not be allowed to estimate a variation. You need to have things varying. You need to have more than one point to estimate a variance. So if I were to divide by k minus one, I'm saying, well, if k equals one, this formula blows up. Yeah. I can't use this formula when k equals one. If I'm trying to estimate the, sp the number of tanks from a spread, the spread is the largest minus the smallest. If the largest and the smallest are the same, there is no spread. What would S be? Zero. Zero. So you would have zero divided by zero. That's undefined. Good. Undefined basically tells me don't try to use me. So we don't want to divide by K or we don't think we should be dividing by K because we shouldn't be able to have a spread when K equals one. We need to have at least two observations. So the actual answer is S times one plus two over K minus one minus one. And again, we do some sanity checks at two and K equals N and we see that everything works out as before. So if k equals n, the spread is n minus 1, and I'll leave that as an exercise for you to show that everything works out. This will give the plus 1 in the end. Notice we have a 2 divided by a k minus 1. You can kind of think about that as before we had 1 plus 1 over k, now we have 1 plus 2 over k minus 1. Think of it as we're expanding both above and below. We're pushing in both directions. We're pushing up from the maximum observed and we're pushing down from the minimum observed. All right, so giving just some rough idea of how to prove this, without going into all the technical details, but just going to sum. So the first is we need a lemma on what is the probability. And so since we're not gonna really be doing a research project on this, I'm not gonna go through the proof. The proof is here. I strongly encourage you to try to make sure you can understand this, but there's a way to calculate what is the probability that the spread equals S. And the spread has to be at least K minus one, and it's at most N two minus N one. And it's a very similar argument as to what we did before. So that's step one. All right, the rest of the proof is very similar to what we did before, but the algebra is a little bit more involved. And repeatedly multiply by one, or we add zero, and then we use a lot of binomial identities. There's a lot of casework that has to be done. So I've put all the details in the appendix if you're interested. If you're not interested, absolutely fine. This is not what I was thinking about for the project I want you all to work on together. You know, the project I want you guys to work on together is going to involve something on error correction and error detection. There will be ways to split it up so that each one of you will have a sub problem to look at. This is not directly related, but the reason it is worth talking about, in addition to being of importance, is that it gives us some really good insights as to how to attack a problem. And that for a lot of things, algebra can be overwhelming. To get a nice closed form answer at the end, you've got to look at things just the right way. All right. So this is one of my favorite tables that I've ever seen in my life. Here's three different months. The first column is the statistical estimate of how many tanks were being produced. The next is the intelligence estimates. And the last is after the war, we could look at the German records and see how many were being produced. And you can see how well the mathematicians, statisticians did. They're essentially within 10%. The intelligence estimates are completely off. So absolutely phenomenal about how well this worked in practice. And what I love about this is it shows you that to have an impact in the world, you don't need the most advanced mathematics. This is mathematics that we were able to do in an hour using essentially basic properties of the Fibonacci, uh, of uh, Pascal's triangle. All right, so what I want to end on today is just a little bit of a talk on regression. So if you haven't seen this before, it's going to give you a little bit of a guide as to what's coming in mathematics. So the idea is to try to find the best fit line or more generally the best fit curve to some data. 
So you believe that you have some input variables and you have a relationship between the input variables and the output variables. We'll concentrate on the case when we have just one input variable, x. And we believe y is linearly dependent on x. So we believe y equals ax plus b. And here are three different ways to choose what the error is going to be. So the error is going to be a function of a and b. And we want to see what is the error of these different line estimates. So the first is you just look at the observed minus the predicted. The second is the absolute value of the observed minus the predicted. And the third is the square of the observed minus the predicted. Of these three error estimates, one of them is terrible and should never be used. Which is the one that's terrible and should never be used? I guess it's the first one because because like the, the ones that are actually smaller can cancel out the ones that are larger. You, you can have positive errors canceling negative errors. Yeah. So if you want, what is the best fit line from the point negative one, negative one to the point one, one? You observe those two values. What do you think the best fit line is? Y equals two X. Yeah. Y equals X. If you take Y equals negative X, you would have an error of two at negative one, canceling out with an error of negative two, or we would have them reversed at X equals one, and you would also have a total error of zero. So we agree that yeah. one just sucks. Now let's look at two and three. Do you have any preference between two and three? They both have positives. I guess probably the, the third formula shows the average better. Like if it has a very, 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 yeah, it probably shows the average better. Not really. Actually, the second one shows the average better. The problem is for the third one, if you have one bad data point, because you square things, it's much worse to have one error of four than two errors of two or four errors of one. So if you have one point that's a little bit off, because you're squaring things, it's going to drag the whole line with it. So the third one is far more sensitive to just one data point. The second one is actually the best in terms of treating all the errors equally. But the reason we like to use the third, um, how many of you have not done calculus? No. So has everybody done calculus? Okay, who yeah. has not done calculus? Okay, so there's a subject called calculus, which talks about how things change. And it turns out that the third measure is not differentiable. It means you can't use the techniques of calculus. So that there are advanced techniques. How many of you have seen calculus? Yeah. Does anyone have calculus? Yes. Okay, two people yeah. have calculus? Yes. Yes, I, I so studied just calculus. Very okay, so three people have seen calculus. Okay, uh, so again, calculus. you don't need calculus. We're doing, I'm sorry? Okay. So you don't need calculus for what we're doing, but if you've seen it, it's nice to just see how math is connected. So the third function is not differentiable. The absolute value function is not differentiable. And so because of that, we can't use calculus. If we, I'm sorry, the, the second one is not differentiable. The third one is differentiable. So when we use calculus, we want to find where's the derivative with respect to A equals zero, where's the derivative with respect to B equals zero. And when the dust settles, it turns out you get a beautiful relationship. So if you know some matrices, you can actually write it down as a matrix equation and you can solve A and B explicitly. 
So that's why we like the square metric. We have explicit solutions. Now, many relationships in life are not linear. If we could only fit linear relationships, then this would be a limited utility. And so one of the other reasons I want to talk about this was frequently the logarithm is not taught well in school. And so this gives me a chance to talk a little bit about why we care about logarithms and about data visualization. How do you present information in a way that people will understand? And so imagine you have a relationship y equals bx to the a. If you take the log of both sides, you get the log of y is a log of x plus b. And now notice that while y and x are related by a power law, the log of y and the log of x are linearly related. And what this means is if we do a log-log transformation, then we can apply linear regression to the log of a, which is the log of x and the log of y. So there's a lot of famous laws in physics. So one of my favorite is Kepler's third law, and he observed this empirically. And this was one of his three laws of planetary motion. The first is that planets travel in ellipses about the sun, where the sun is at one of the foci. The second is if you draw a line from, I believe it's the sun to the planet, then in equal amounts of time, the area swept out is equal. And the third is the more complicated one, that if T is the period and L is the length of the semi-major axis of the ellipse, then T squared is proportional to L cubed. This law is significantly more involved than the other two. Assume we don't know this law. Assume we don't know that T squared is proportional to L cubed. Can we discover this law through statistics? And instead of doing T squared and L cubed, I could do t equals b l to the 1.5. I just take the square root of both sides. You should have known this was coming because if you go back a slide, I have t squared is equal to b to the tilde l cubed. Why would I use a b to the tilde? Why would I put a tilde on something? The reason I'm putting a tilde on it is because it's not going to last long. I'm going to do some transform, and the transformed quantity is the more fundamental. So it's really t is proportional to l to the 1.5, or l to the 3 halves. Anybody know how many planets there are? So how many planets are there in the solar system? Eight. There's eight. There used to be nine. Pluto used to be a planet. It's been downgraded. I actually know somebody who knows the person who had to downgrade the planet at the, you know, he was the one who had to hit enter. So here is some data. So here's the semi-major axis for a bunch of planets. I have not included Pluto as much as it pains me. And I've included the orbital periods. And so we're gonna to try to figure out Let's guess T is equal to B L to the A for some A and B. We don't know what they are. Is there a way to figure out what they are? Any thoughts what B should be if you look at this data? If you look at this data, there's a pretty good idea as to what B should be. B should be so approximately like what? Uh, should it be approximately one? Because one, yeah. It's a Earth. Excellent. Why should it be approximately one? The, the the Earth is one, and then period is uh, almost one. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at the units we're using, we have the distance of the semi-major axis has Earth being one AU, one astronomical unit, and the period of Earth is about one point one seven four years. So it really looks like B should be about one. And so I've highlighted those in red. That data point is extremely useful. There's a lot of strange units. Um, a slug, have you ever heard of a slug? Uh, no. 
I'll let you Google slug. Slug is a real unit. Then there's a bunch of fake units that people have made up. A Bruno is the volume in cubic centimeters made when you drop a grand piano off a third floor building at MIT. MIT is responsible for a lot of strange units. Uh, have you heard of the Trojan War? So this is a literary question. Have you heard of the Trojan War? Have any of you heard of Helen of Troy? No. I, she was abducted by a Trojan prince and then the Greeks sent a fleet oh. to bring her back. And she was claimed to be so beautiful, you know, her beauty was enough to launch a thousand ships. And so several people have remarked over the years that the unit of beauty should be a Helen. Well, a Helen, you know, most people are not going to be capable of launching a thousand ships. So they said a Millie Helen, enough beauty to launch one ship is a more natural unit of measurement. Uh, Smoot is another famous one. There was a fraternity in MIT and they decided they wanted to know how long a, a bridge was. Oops, sorry, I'll get the pictures later. And so what they did is they took one of the freshmen and they lay him down and then they picked him up and they lay him down again and they measured how long the bridge was. And I'll say a little bit more at this time at the end of the day. But this is one of my favorite pictures. This is a plot of the log of T against the log of L. It's a log log plot. Look at how beautifully the line the best fit line passes through those eight data points. And we get A is about 1.49986 and B is about 0 0.0001487. And since we expected B to be about one, it's not surprising that the log of big B is very close to zero. So this is an incredible victory for the method of least squares we were actually able to sniff out a nonlinear relationship. And again, as you start doing original research, both with me and then later in life, you want to try to get a sense of what you think the answer can be. And then once you have the answer, can you prove it? So Kepler did not prove his laws. For Kepler, these were empirical observations inspired by looking at a lot of data, much of it coming from the great Tycho Brahe. And then these three laws provided clues to the great Sir Isaac Newton when he was trying to figure out the law of universal gravitation. He said, well, whatever I have, it should be able to explain Kepler's three laws because the experimental data backs up Kepler. So these observations inspired Kepler who then inspired Newton. And this was absolutely essential in developing the correct theory of gravity. Right. So I had mentioned smooth. So this is the Harvard Bridge. It's about 620.1 meters. Or if you measure it in smooths, it's about 364.1 smooths plus or minus an ear. They actually took pictures of him when they would pick him up and drag him along the bridge. When they did this at first, the police and the people in Cambridge where MIT is located were not amused and they painted over the smoot marks. Well, the MIT students weren't going to let that stand. So they picked up smoot and they did this again. And they went back and forth until finally the police said to hell with it, just leave the smoot marks. And it turns out that over time, the smoot marks have grown on people. And now when there's an accident on the bridge, they report how many smoots the accident was from the end of the bridge. Is the smoot a good unit of measurement? Do you think the smoot is a good unit of measurement? Uh, I don't think so. No. It's a terrible unit of measurement. If you want to figure out what a smoot is, how would you do that? Do you have to get a hold of smoot himself? What if his height changes over time? It's not reproducible. It's not defined in good standards. It's funny. It's humorous. But we now define, you know, time, for instance, as how far light travels. I'm sorry. Um, 
the amount of time, I think time is defined. Uh, I, I should have checked this. They keep, they changed how things were defined, but you know, the speed of light is a universal uh, fixture. The meter yeah. is an artificial thing. Uh, I think time is defined in terms of vibrations, maybe of a cesium atom or something like that. But you try to have natural definitions of units so that other people can get the same thing as you. So I'll end with another great example of using regret. You heard of a birthday problem. So, so the birthday problem is assume every birthday is equally likely for people. How many people do you need to have in a room before you have a 50% chance that two people share a birthday? Has anybody heard of this problem before? No. Uh, yes. Why? Right, anybody? How many people you would need? Do you think 400 people would be enough? So do you think 400 people would be enough? Uh, yes. Somebody should answer. Yes. Why is 400 people enough? That's bigger than 365. Yeah. You know, this is the pigeonhole principle. There's only 365, 366 days. What about 180 people? Do you think that should be enough? Maybe. You have to use the, I don't know, you have to use statistic to find out. Well, imagine you have 170 people and nobody shares a birthday. When the next person walks in, approximately what's their chance that they share a birthday with somebody already in the room? Uh, it's like the number of people before he walks in uh, divided by 365. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be about a half. All the people around 170, 175, each person coming in has about a 50-50 chance of matching somebody before. So you should need far fewer than 180 people. Because you know, by the time you get to 170, you have almost a 50-50 chance when new people walk in. So a nice problem using some analysis is to show that if there are D days in the year, the answer is approximately the square root of D times the square root of log of four. So I want to show you how you could sniff this out using regression. Which do you think is the more important part, that it's d to the one half or that it's that times the square root of log of four? Which do you think is more important, the exponent on d or the constant factor? Exponent. Uh, the exponent? Yeah, exponent. Yeah, the exponent, because that tells you as you change D, that tells you how the answer changes. It gives you the growth rate. So, we did some, so I did some simulations. I plotted the data. And you know, the best fit lines I got, um, you know, I did it twice, was you know, A was about 0.5 in both cases. Um, B varied a lot more. But you know, the data really supports that square root exponent. And this is just a general principle that you can often sniff out these relationships. Uh, plotting the German tank problem, I'm not going to go into this. There's a lot of technicalities as to why this plot looks so bad. There's a lot of work you need to do to look at things the right way. When you look at it the right way, uh, plotting, now I'm using M and 1 over K, you can see a beautiful plane. This is the generalization of a linear relationship. It's a planar relationship with two parameters, log of M and 1 over K. I'm going to skip the references. I'm going to just end with Smoot. So this is the person who the MIT fraternity used to measure the bridge. He ended up becoming the chairman of the American National Standards Institute and president of the International Organization for Standardization. So I always find this amusing that what began as a college prank actually helped this guy with a wonderful career. 
Can you imagine him applying for jobs? You know, why do you think you would be a good chairman of the American National Standards Institute? Well, I, I don't like to brag, but I am a unit of measurement myself. There's a terrific lesson in this. There are so many talented people in the world. You need to find a way to distinguish yourself. You need to have a good, compelling story that you can tell. And so in addition to trying to do math with you, I want to try to just give you some general advice on how you can get noticed. It's not enough to just do good work. You want people to see the work. There are so many people doing so many things. This is why at the end of the summer, we will try to write up what we did for publication. You know, whenever possible, you try to give talks on the work that you're doing. You make sure your colleagues are aware of what you're doing. All right. As always, it is fun chatting with you on math. There's a lot of stuff we're doing. There's a huge amount of information overload. A lot of the stuff is not really related to the research project, and that's going to be lecture four. So lecture four, we'll finally start getting into the material that I want you to try to generalize. But I wanted you to get some sense of how to look at problems first before we jump into this so that you have some intuition, some thoughts about how to approach things. All right, have a great evening, all. I will try to upload the lectures. Odds are uh, I might be able to get the Zoom link tonight, but the YouTube link will probably not come until sometime tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great Bye. evening, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye. Bye.